Uh, a very good afternoon, everyone. Uh, once again, I welcome you to the third Morong Lecture, a series initiated by the Morong Express for uh, Morong for Indigenous Affairs and Just Peace and the Morong Express to explore and raise discourses on diverse issues and to offer perspective. Your presence here reflect your commitment and conviction to the issues related to, to this lecture. I sincerely thank you all and welcome you. Uh, what are the principles of human rights? Uh, if you look at the Milestone Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948, the United Nations defined them as right inherent to all human beings, whatever our nationality, place of res residence, sex, national or ethnic origin, color, religion, language, or any status without discrimination. Therefore, in essence, human rights are universal, unalienable, individual, divisible and interdependent. Uh, for me, the essence of human rights, I believe, lies in answering two important questions. First, are we as individuals and as society enjoying those rights? And secondly, following the first, do we allow others to enjoy the same? Uh, Naga society has been grappling with these questions over the years, from the old age ASPA to the modern Tibravides. In such a scenario, what language and tools, tools must Naga people use to gain life of dignity, equality, and peace? How do we ensure equal participation and thus equal ownership of society, of women, and other marginalized? And how do we reiterate our status as a people with each of its indigenous enjoying right to life and liberty? To answer this, I I cannot find more suitable individuals than our two speakers today, Mr. Ningin Lo Kromi and Dr. Visagrono Hippo. Mr. Gromi, Gromi a self-confessed fighter against institutional dogmatism and tyranny, has illustrious bodies of work speak for, him, for itself. His ardent commitment and conviction for various causes are undoubtedly reflected in his service to different organizations under various capacities with varying role and responsibilities. Uh, a founding father, uh, members and, excuse me, uh, first organizing secretary of all Nagaland College Student Union, he helped address issues of rights on a number of civil, civil platforms, including the NSF. He has served the Naga people in, in BMHR as, as Vegas from 1986 and is currently the currently the General Secretary of the Rights Body. He has been a former member of, former General Secretary of Naga Hoho, and also a member of Forum for Naga Reconciliation, and currently is an ex also executive member of Asian Indigenous People Pack. The other speaker today, Dr. Visagono Hippu, is a sociologist by training and educationist by profession, currently the principal of Chafu Christian College. Uh, she has co-authored many sociology books for Nagaland Board of School Education, as well as Nagaland University, and also a member of various educational bodies in Put at State and in New, uh, Nagaland University. And she's also part of designing many academic courses in both the institution. And apart from being an educationist, she holds credits for organizing various national and international sem seminars with topics ranging from women issue, Naga polity, culture, social inclusion, and ex exclusion, among others. Therefore, without much ado, uh, I now invite the first speaker, Dr. Visakono Hippu, to speak, to give a take on human rights in Nag Naga society, today and tomorrow. You can take
Good afternoon, everybody. I'm just a novice on the topic that has been given to us by our gracious Morung Express, coming up with this initiative to discuss certain essential elements that are never being discussed enough. I'm just here as an everyday person. I told them that I have no technical knowledge and I'm not trained in any way for this human, human rights, whatever, but also I, in the small way that I can, the b very basic, maybe common sense that I have, I also know that I am part of this human rights. That is just the qualification that has given me the right to stand before you today. This human rights education is also something which we in the educational institutions are also giving a lot of thought to. We know that unless we also educate our students on the rights of others and of themselves, we know that there will be no mutual give and take or no mutual respect. So on this, I thought I will just give you my perception of what I see in the Naga society as of the past, now, and what I envision for the future, which I've shown in that small clipping, which has been helped by uh, my colleague, Deville. So that's there. This is what I have to say on this, just random thoughts. I'll just take about, uh, I'll stop at 2, 2.10. I'll just take 10 minutes or 12 minutes or so. This is what I have to say on this, just my random thoughts on human rights in Naga society for today and tomorrow. And for which I also had to touch the past a little bit. The ethical terrain of human beings in any given society, including the Naga society, lies in its abilities, sensitivities and sensibilities in a given time frame and context within an acceptable moral potential. Naga patriotism, which made me develop an idea of my past as per the clip. Naga patriotism, inspired by the idea of protecting one's land, people and culture dominated our society ever since the recognition of the other entities. The past holds a sober emotional attachment for every Naga who has an inkling of the initial Naga story. However, of late, a kind of nationalism, which everyday people like me are failing to identify with, is fearsomely looming large, thus confuses and oftentimes violates my basic human rights. There is no doubt that every present Naga, and for those Nagas who are to come also, have an inborn patriotism within us, but which unfortunately cannot be directed anywhere in spite of claiming a common dream, sense a common way. Many societies in the world are gaining fresh standards in the arena of human rights, but most Nagas feel and look degraded as human beings when compared to those who enjoy optimal freedom within the boundaries of a sensitized and humanized social norm. In that scenario, many of us have lost both our rights and obligations vis-a-vis -vis duties. We are morally down and out. Our values have gone down the drain. Certainly, we are not children of a lesser God, but we definitely are trapped in our own mess bigger than the infamous Shillong Accord of 1975. My perception of the past Naga society is better than the present as far as human rights are concerned. I imagine the past little village republics of having good semblance of democracy, self-sufficient economy, and proper usage of taboos, norms, and values for natural village citizenry. It just came about autom automatically. The rights of each other regarded and respected in the past, duties and responsibilities fulfilled without reminders or compulsion, the idea of we feeling which propels one to be a patriot 
and thereon to be a nationalist or a national worker is not just coming as an in inspiration at the moment for the present. The very basic citizenry habits are not conducive for growth in the Naga society, all because our human rights are no longer counted or recognized for fielding, forget about implementation. The rule of law has surrendered to mobocracy in Naga society. Strength is might. And might is right. Generations more will, it will take generations more to clean the mess or the system that has infested our Naga society. I doubt if my generation will live to see our Naga society where rationality clears issues of gender equity, child abuse, community relations, majority-minority conflicts, forward-backward dilemmas, difficulties of unity and reconciliation without willing to change at the individual and collective levels. Come what may, I wish to see my children and the future Nagas that we get to live in the dream that I dreamt, in the dream that my fathers dreamt for me, but which unfortunately I did not get. And this is what I have to say to the world. Oh yes, I want to live with my mountains. Oh yes, I want to live with my culture. Oh yes, I want to relive the good past. Oh yes, I want to wipe out the blunders. Oh yes, I want to throw the begging bowl. Oh no, do not leave me out yet again, the everyday people. Promise not, threaten not, we must act now. And act for us now. Oh yes, I will be in the world's global village, onward bound to civil life, whichever good way. This is what I have to say when it comes to human rights today. If we look at our society now, there is no area, there is no uh, there is nowhere, I think, even if we look at the civil life, even if we look within ourselves, even if we look at the tribal or the kel or polity or whatever, legal, I think we are in that mess where unless a miracle happens, we will not be able to get out of the mess that we have created mostly for ourselves. In the past, I grew up as a child of the 70s, and I, I, also, I also, I think I have, my rights have been infringed upon in that I have been denied of a happy childhood because when I look back at my childhood, I see, being, I see myself being placed in a political situation where I may not have been directly affected, but psychologically and even like uh, many times we see undergrounds being taken. We see, I also have seen two uh, undergrounds. Those days, the Naga army being killed and carry, uh, carried like uh, pigs like those have come to disturb us. We have seen our neighbors being taken to prison. My own father had to go to prison because he was not an un underground worker, but he was involved in measuring rice. So part of the Russian civil group and therefore they had to go to the jail like that. So we were proud of that then. I was pretty much proud that I was a daughter of an ex, uh, of an ex convict. I was very proud then. But then if I have to look at now, their sacrifices, whatever they have done, it has all gone in vain. For what? We are trying to commercialize even the Shilonga court. But then, let us go back and look at what actually happened before the Shilonga court. What were the rights, the human rights that were violated and put across the everyday people? Not just those who were in the jungle fighting, but even for the civilians, for the daughters, for the wives, and even the children. They were made to go to uh, temporary concentration camps. And that is how they were made to suffer in such a way. But that suf suffering and that psychological, I think, torture was, uh, maybe in a way people took pride in it. They suffered and that they took pride in it. And that is how it was in the past then. That's my memory of the past. But if we are to look at it now, I feel hesitant to shout at some, at some groups which I know are wrong. I feel hesitant to name anybody who is doing wrong because the law that has to protect me is no longer there. 
So who am I? Just a mere human being here, an everyday woman here standing in front of you. Who am I? I cannot just, I'm just maybe too restricted to even open my mouth and even maybe tell you what I actually feel inside of me. These are all free, freedom restrictions when it comes to speech, when it comes to even our thoughts are restricted. Mind you, we think of certain things and we restrict ourselves. Oh, that will lead me to trouble. Where is this freedom that we are living now? I think as Nagas, if, even if we look at the plight of little children, my heart goes out for those of the Nagas who come from across the border and who are on the pretext of being given education, they're made to work like slaves in our Naga homes. By us, to our own people, these are violations of child rights also. We're talking about equity, even when it comes to women and all of this. But I think these are like we are also too busy with issues that do not really come and affect or that do not really come and impact upon the working of the villagers' kitchens in their households. We're just too carried away, I think, many times by Western feminism. I think these are all things that we need to retract back from, come back, look at ourselves, retrospect, change, and also maybe in our own small ways. We cannot be all activists like our Sir Ningolo here. I can never be and I will not be. I have a duty, some other duties to perform, but in my own small way, I also, I should, and I will also try to promote the promotion of human rights to be acted out to others and others to give to, uh, to give it to us. Do unto others what you would like them to do unto you. Is what human rights to me is all about. And this I am not getting in our present Naga society. This the many homes in the rural areas are not getting. They're not getting the right to live as decently. They're not getting the right to even exercise their freedoms. Talk about our political right. It's a joke in Naglen. My students, when election, state election comes, they want to go for uh, like exercising their, their franchise. So what I tell them is, anybody who is below 18, don't go. It's against the Constitution. Those who wish to go, you go above 18. When they go back, they come back. Then we go for a sort of uh, altar call type. Oh, we will not take proxy. Uh, who will not go and vote proxy? Raise your hands. Who will not take money for money uh, for your vote? Raise your hands. And that is what we do and send them. But when they come back, they come back with this story. My grandfather voted on behalf of all our clan members. I could not go inside. What is this? We cannot even decide for our future in any way. Forget about our, uh, forget about our present. We cannot decide things or we cannot even speak openly about things that, are, that truly matters in our hearts. This, if we are to look at it, I think Naglan is also one state where our society is also one state our where human rights is badly violated. We always say, at least Nagaland has imported something to the rest of the states. That is AFSPA. How have we responded to AFSPA, even after all these ceasefires and everything has come about? Have we taken another stand that is worse than what has been perpetrated to us? I think we need to ask ourselves. If we, we are talking big things here, we are thinking big things here, but a country-made revolver is pointed at you. Then you forget all your rights, you forget the rights of others, and you forget all your strength, you forget all your bravery, and then you yield to the negative elements in our society. We are in that kind of uh, uh, a society we're in. The mob is ruling. When I say mob, I don't just uh, include those who are actually yielding the gun or whatever, threaten, who roam about threatening on behalf of others. I think we have uh, leaders in the mob who live in glass houses, and I think those are the ones that need to change first before we actually talk about human rights here, so that 
the, the government or even the law will become supreme and we will get pre protected, we will also get to live and maybe enjoy a life, a decent life, which can only come about only when our rights are ensured to us. If not, where do you, where do you ask for your rights to be implemented? There's nowhere where you can go. And even if you go, will your right be ensured to you? I think the question has become a big confusion. And that is where we can talk about economy, we can talk about religion, we can, we can talk about so many things. But in every of these sphere, I think the Naga scenario, as far as human rights are concerned, is pathetically low. This is what I have to say. Thank you.